Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you that it gives us wisdom and insight into the kingdom of your beloved Son, whose kingdom you have transferred us into. Thank you. We pray, Lord, that you would bless us this morning with wisdom from these verses that we will examine, that we will have an understanding of your truth, that we may have an understanding of you, to the praise of your goodness and glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Galatians chapter 3, I'm going to ask you to jump right to the verse we'll be addressing primarily today, verse 11. We are going to be looking at a multitude of verses this morning. So I would encourage you to have your Bible ready, and for the sake of time, I realize that you may not be able to look at each one of them specifically as we read through them. I would encourage you, write the reference down and you, we can go back to it. And you'll see shortly why we are going to be examining these verses. Galatians chapter 3, or excuse me, Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. And right after we read this, I'm going to, have to ask you to flip over with me to Galatians chapter 3. So if you want to get that verse or that chapter ready, uh, you can do that now. Colossians 3.11, and we'll be looking at Galatians 3 and 28. Colossians 3.11, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, and freeman, but Christ is all and in all. Now let's back up in your Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 3. And to verse 28. Verse 27, Paul said, "You, For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. And then he comes to verse 28 and writes, There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free man. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. Go back over to Colossians with me. You'll recall from last week that we examined that 10th verse that reads as follows, and have put on the new self who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. And now as he moves into this 11th verse, he begins to address, in essence, this renewal. And whenever you examine these two verses that we read this morning, Colossians 3.11, Galatians 3.28, you see immediately that they are very, very similar. And in essence, they are conveying the same truth that we will come to. That's actually very clearly stated in each one of the verses. But these two verses around them, actually, there is much controversy, believe it or not. And it is amazing whenever you consider these verses in the clarity and the context of Scripture, you would think, what's the confusion? Well, there's multiple reasons for the confusion. I think one of them is that these verses are, as many verses in Scripture, just very quickly addressed and move on to another verse. The summary of them is hit on without recognizing the biblical history that's involved in both of these verses. Oftentimes, what will happen is people will immediately, as they're explaining the verses, jump to the cultural context of the verses. And there's not necessarily anything wrong with that, because certainly there is a cultural aspect involved in each of these verses. But to jump immediately to that cultural aspect of the verses without a consideration, a deep consideration of the historical meaning and significance behind these verses leads to 
much of the misunderstanding that we run into with it today. And this misunderstanding is not just out there, but it's in very conservative circles as well. So what I wanted to do this morning, I want us to get some background as to why the Apostle would, in both of these books, even bring this truth up. And to do that, we're going to be going back into the Old Testament in a moment. We're going to look to another verse in the New Testament here, but we're going to go back into the Old Testament. And what we're going to do in the Old Testament is we're going to first look at this biblical fact, and that is that God chose the nation of Israel. God chose the nation of Israel. Then we're going to look at the fact that He chose them for a purpose. And we'll see what that purpose is. God chose Israel. He chose them for a specific purpose. And then we're going to see how sin took hold of that truth that God chose Israel, that He chose them for a very specific purpose. We're going to see how sin took hold of that truth and warped it. And warped that truth. And then we're going to see how God corrected that understanding as we move into the New Testament. And then we will look at, Lord willing, how this precious truth is even warped and corrupted today. And you know, that's the way sin works. It doesn't always just totally negate what God has said. It takes what He says and twists it to its own end, to its own destruction, ultimately, but to a way that will gratify itself and entirely miss God's objective. So, to begin with, I'm going to ask you to look with me to the book of Acts this morning, chapter 14. In Acts 14, Paul is preaching here to Gentiles. Acts 14, Paul is preaching to Gentiles, and I'm going to ask you to move down in the text to verse 16 with me. Acts 14, 16. In the 16th verse, Paul is going to give, in a single verse here, 16 and 17, just really a a historical summary. He's going to state a fact of something that God did with regard to the world. Acts 14, 16 says, In the generations gone by, He permitted, and notice this phrase, all the nations to go their own ways. Now he goes on and he says, And yet He did not leave Himself without witness, and that He did good and gave you rains from heaven, and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. Notice that. He let them go their own ways, and in letting them go their own ways, He didn't leave them without a witness. And then, the witness here is the witness of the creation that He mentions. Notice this. And that He did good and gave you rains from heaven, and fruitful seasons, satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. In other words, as Matthew says, that God poured out His loving kindness and His mercy even on those who were unbelievers, even on those who had gone their own way. But notice the phrase again, God let all the nations go their own way. But God was also doing something else during that time. Something very, very significant. And that is, he was going to raise up and was in the process of raising up a nation for himself. The nation Israel. And it is a clear and explicit truth all through the Old Testament and into the New Testament that God chose the nation of Israel. And we're going to look at those verses now. And I would encourage you, if you write these down, you can go back and look at them in the context that they're stated. We're just going to look at the fact that God chose them this morning. Um, And 
um, I encourage you to understand some of the significance of the context. I'm going to ask you to go with me initially to Exodus chapter 19. Exodus 19, and there in the text down to verse 4. You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, how I bore you, God speaking to Israel, on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. Notice this. He says in that fifth verse, you, will, you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. So he's conveying out of all the peoples on the earth, I'm taking you as my possession to myself. Verse 6, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak, and notice this, to the sons of of Israel. Move over to Deuteronomy chapter 14, verse 2. Deuteronomy 14 and verse 2. For you are a holy people, and notice this, to the Lord your God. And the Lord has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of of the earth. Remember from Acts 14, God had let all the nations go their own way, but he took and he developed this nation, Israel, and he chose them. He chose them, and then actually he developed them into a nation. Deuteronomy 28. Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 9. The Lord will establish you as a holy people to himself, as he swore to you if you keep the commandments of the Lord your God and walk in his ways. Deuteronomy 28, 9, verse 10 says, So all the peoples of the earth will see that you are called by the name of the Lord, and they will be afraid of you. Look in your Bibles to... Back to Exodus with me, chapter 6, Exodus chapter 6, in chapter 6 of Exodus down to verse 7. Then I will make you for my people, then I will take you for my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. Look in your Bible to Leviticus chapter 20. Leviticus 20. And verse. 23, Leviticus 20, 23. Moreover, you shall not follow the customs of the nation which I will drive out before you, for they did all these things, and therefore I have abhorred them. Hence I have said to you, you are to possess their land, and I myself will give it to you to possess it, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God, and notice this, who has separated you from the peoples. Out of all the nations, God chose and built the nation Israel, and he separated them from out of all of the other nations. Write this verse down, and you can reference it later. Amos chapter 3, verse 2 says, You only have I chosen among all the families of the earth. Therefore, I will punish you for your iniquities. 
But in particular, in that phrase, we recognize that God has chosen Israel from all the families of the earth. Back here in Leviticus 20, jump down to verse 26. Thus you are to be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy, and I have set you apart from the peoples to be mine. To be mine. Deuteronomy 26. You notice many of these right now are appearing in these first five books of the Bible, and in particular where Moses is addressing the children of Israel after God has developed them into a nation. Chapter 20 of Leviticus again, and down to verse 26. Or, excuse me, Deuteronomy 26, down to verse 27. Let's go back up, actually. Deuteronomy 26, let's go to verse 17. You have today declared the Lord to be your God, and that you would walk in his ways and keep his statutes, his commandments, and his ordinances, and listen to his voice. The Lord has today declared to you to be his people, a treasured possession, as he promised you, and that you should keep all his commandments, and that he will set you on high, or set you high above all nations which he has made for praise, fame, and honor, and that you shall be a consecrated people to the Lord your God as he has spoken. Chapter 29, Deuteronomy 29. And verse 13, in order that he may establish you today as his people, and that he may be your God just as he spoke to you, and as he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Go with me to 1 Kings chapter 8, 1 Kings chapter 8. Verse 52, 1 Kings 8, 52. That your eyes may be open to the supplication of your servant and to the supplication of your people Israel to listen to them whenever they call to you. For you have separated them from all the peoples of the earth as your inheritance, as you spoke through Moses, your servant, when you brought our fathers forth from Egypt, O Lord God. God clearly chose Israel, and he chose them as a nation. He separated them from all the other nations of the world, those nations that had gone their own way. First Chronicles chapter 16, First Chronicles 16, down to verse 13. O seed of Israel, his servants, sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. Chapter 17, 1 Chronicles 17 and 21. And what one nation in the earth is like your people Israel, whom God went to redeem for himself as a people, to make you a name by great and terrible, excuse me, God went in to redeem for himself as a people to make you a name by great and terrible things in driving out nations from before your people whom you redeemed out of Egypt. Psalm 33 and verse 12. Psalm 33 and 12. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people whom he has chosen for his own inheritance. Psalm 105. Psalm 105. 
and verse 6. O seed of Abraham, his servant, O sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. Psalm 106 and verse 5. That I may see the prosperity of your chosen ones, that I may rejoice in the gladness of your nation, that I may glory with your inheritance. Psalm 135 and there to verse 4. Psalm 135 verse 4. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his own possession. Psalm 149 and verse 2. Let Israel be glad in his maker. Let the sons of Zion rejoice in their king. Isaiah 41 verse 8. Isaiah 41 and verse 8. But you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, descendant of Abraham, my friend. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 3. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I have given Egypt as your ransom, Cush and Seba in your place. Since you are precious in my sight, since you are honored, and I love you, I will give other men in your place and other peoples in exchange for your life. 44 of Isaiah and verse 1. Isaiah 44 and verse 1. But now listen, O Jacob, my servant, and Israel, whom I have chosen. Acts chapter 13 into the New Testament. Acts 13 verse 17. The God of this people Israel chose our fathers and made the people great during their stay in the land of Egypt, and with an uplifted arm he led them out from it. Romans chapter 9. Verse 4. Who are the Israelites? to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. Wow. There should be no doubt after going through all of those verses, and really there are several others, those verses are those that are very clear and explicit of that fact that God chose Israel. Now, there are many who come to those verses and they want to spiritualize those verses. And that's a sad commentary whenever they do that. And we'll address that very briefly a little later. But those verses are speaking very clearly, very explicitly, and very literally to God's choice of a specific nation out of all the other nations all the others had gone their way. They were doing their own thing. They were pursuing their own evil desires. But God took a nation and he developed it and he used it for a purpose. And I want us to spend a moment looking at that purpose. And it's simply this, that God chose Israel as a witness to himself. You remember God didn't leave himself without witness by these other nations, right? According to Acts chapter 14, God still sent his rain and his son on them, and he blessed them that their crops grew and their hearts were happy. But to Israel, God did something very, very unique. He gave them, as we just read in Romans 9, the revelation of his word. He gave it to them. He gave it to them at the very beginning of their time 
as a nation, after God had de was developing them, he gave it to them in Moses and through Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. God chose Israel as his witness. Isaiah chapter 43. Go back into the Old Testament with me. Isaiah 43. Isaiah 43, and there down to verse 10. Again, you can't make it any more clear. God says to Israel, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, so that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed, and there will be none after me. As a matter of fact, we don't have the time to do this right now here in this context, but you see a hint of it right here in this verse, and it's explicit later on in the chapter and elsewhere in the book of Isaiah, and that is that Israel, as God's witnesses, he is going to bear witness of himself through them in contrast to all the pagans and their gods that they created. He's going to demonstrate himself through Israel that he alone is God and there is no other. Isaiah chapter 43, verse 12. It is I who have declared and saved and proclaimed, and there was no strange God among you, so you are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. Look at chapter 44. Verse 8, do not tremble and do not be afraid. Have I not long since announced it to you and declared it? And you are my witnesses. Is there any God besides me or is there any other rock I know of none? Listen, although God had permitted all the other nations to go their own way, and indeed they did that. He selected the nation of Israel out of all the other nations, as we have seen this morning. He chose Israel not because they were righteous or even because they were necessarily better than the other nations, for they were all equally sinners. There is no doubt about that. Through Israel, God chose to declare himself and his way by establishing them as a holy people to himself. We read that in Exodus chapter 19, verse 6, and Deuteronomy 7, and verse 6, and 28, 9. Thereby he made this nation his witness. And they were distinguished as his witness from all the other nations of the world who had gone their own way. As Israel walked in obedience to God, they were witnesses to the glory of the one and only God. This is explicitly exemplified in multiple places in Scripture. They were witnesses of God to the pagan nations around them, nations that had gone their own way. There's one place at the very onset of their having left Egypt, and by the way, if you go back into Egypt, you even see there that God was bearing himself witness while they were there in Egypt. The plagues that were befalling the Egyptians were not coming on the Israelites. Imagine the entire land was covered in darkness, but not Goshen. That's an amazing thing. The Israelites were preserved as they put the blood over the lintels of their door from the death angel when the firstborn of every person and creature was killed. But Joshua chapter 2, turn there with me if you will for a moment. Joshua chapter 2, very powerful encounter the spies have here with Rahab, Joshua chapter 2, they've come out of Israel, or they've come out of Egypt, they've wandered in the wilderness for 40 years, 
And now God is bringing them into the promised land, Joshua chapter 2. The spies have gone in. They have met Rahab. Jump down to verse 8. Now before they, that is the spies, lay down, she, that is Rahab, came up to the roof, came up to them on the roof and said to them, she's speaking to these two spies, she said, I know, and listen to this closely, here's a pagan woman, here's a harlot speaking to them. I know that the Lord has given you the land. Notice how she addresses God. I know that the Lord has given you the land. Joshua 2, 9. And that the terror of you has fallen on us and that all the inhabitants of the land have melted away before you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea before you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan, to Sihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. Verse 11, When we heard of it, our hearts melted, and no courage remained in any man any longer because of you. For the Lord your God, He is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. She was getting, she got the message, didn't she? She recognized that all the false gods were powerless. She recognized all the pagan gods were powerless, and thus they were false gods because God has shown Himself, and He did so through the children of Israel. But there are others that we could see, even whenever God was preparing this nation, and you know He chose and selected a very specific man to do that. Clear back in the book of Genesis, chapter 14. Go there with me. Genesis chapter 14. In Genesis 14, go down with me to verse 17. Genesis 14, 17. This is with regard to Abraham. Notice this. When Abram heard that his uh, relative, Genesis 14, actually I'm backing up to verse 14. When Abram heard that his relative, that's Lot, had been taken captive. He led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went to pursuit, or in pursuit, as far as Dan. He divided his forces against them by night. He and his servants and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. He brought back all the goods also and brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and all the one women and the people. Verse 17. Then after his return from the defeat of Chedorlaomer and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Shiva, that is the king's valley. Now notice what happens here. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God, most high. He blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham, Abram of God, most high, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be God, most high, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. He gave him a tenth of all. Abram gave the tenth to Melchizedek. Notice the king of Sodom's response. Sodom, the king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God most high, possessor of heaven and earth. That little statement, by the way, God most high, possessor of heaven and earth, cancels out all false gods. It's clear what he's saying. It may not always be clear to us, but these people got the message. They not only got it in words, but they also just saw it demonstrated. And I will not take a thread or a sandal, thong, or anything that is yours for fear, you would say, I have made Abram rich. It was God who had blessed Abram. 
and he didn't want any mistake about that. I'm going to give you a few other references. We're really running out of time, and there's much more to look at in this. I'll give you these references. I'll encourage you to go and look at them, but not only was Abram a witness here in Canaan, but you're aware of the fact that Joseph was a witness in Egypt, beginning in Genesis chapter 39, clear through verse or chapter 50. Joseph, the Israelite, was a witness to these Egyptians, starting right in uh, his very beginning entrance into Egypt in Potiphar's house. Moses, Deuteronomy 32 and 31, with Joshua 2, 9 through 12, as we read earlier concerning Rahab, Moses was a witness to the people around them, to those false gods or to the nations who develop false gods, as Rahab mentioned, Sihon and Og. They were a witness of God to them. Jonah was a witness of God. He was a witness of God to Nineveh. As a matter of fact, the Bible tells us in the New Testament that Nineveh repented at the preaching of Jonah. That's in the book of Luke, chapter 11, verse 32. Whenever God called Jeremiah as a prophet, he said that Jeremiah was to be his prophet to the nations, not just to Israel, but to the nations. Jeremiah was then a Jewish prophet appointed by God in chapter 1 of Jeremiah, verses 9 and 10, over the nations, over the nations. All this under the heading that God chose Israel as a witness for himself. Daniel was a prophet to nations and a witness of God. As a matter of fact, whenever you go into the New Testament, I'm going to ask you to do that with me, and go there to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. Whenever Jesus came along, He didn't nullify any of that, that God had chosen Israel, that God had chosen Israel as a witness. He actually affirmed it. Matthew chapter 10, verse 5. As Jesus is sending out the twelve, notice what He did. These twelve, G these twelve Jesus sent out after instructing them, do not go in the way of the Gentiles, and do not enter any of the Samaritans, to any city of the Samaritans. Very clear. But rather, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Don't go to them. First, go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Actually, he didn't even say first here. Just go to the house of the lost sheep of Israel. Later on in Matthew 28, starting in Jerusalem, he will send them to the world. So he starts in Jerusalem, preaches there to the Jews first, and then to the other nations. How about in John chapter 4, verse 19? John 4, 19, to the woman at the well. In verse 19, John chapter 4, 19, Jesus speaking to the woman at the well, she responded to him and said, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and you people, and whenever she says, you, and then the word people is added there. It's to bring in the context. She's speaking about Jews and Israelites in particular. And she says, you people say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. And they were right. Because God was revealing himself to the people of Israel, and he did so in Jerusalem. And you remember in all the feasts, God called Israel certain times of the year. All the men of the nation, wherever they lived, they were to come to Jerusalem to worship the Lord. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, an hour is coming when neither in this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. And notice verse 22. You worship what you do not know. 
that's not a, he's not commending her there. He's telling her something that should prick her heart. He said, you worship what you do not know. We, that is the Jews, worship what we know. And then he said, for salvation is from the Jews. Now that doesn't mean that you got to be Jewish to be saved. And it doesn't mean that that Judaism is instrumental in any way in so far as you being born again or being saved. But what it is, is, and he is conveying that God had given the revelation of the need for salvation to the nation of Israel, and eventually the Savior himself would come from that nation. Look at Romans chapter 1, verse 16. Romans 1, 16. Romans 1 and verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. But then notice what he said. To the Jew first and also to the Greek. He's recognizing that priority that God had set. And to the Jew first actually backs up and encompasses all of that that we read where God says, I've chosen those or the nation of Israel. It doesn't mean that Greeks are getting second best. No, it's to be understood in the context both of the Old Testament as well as Galatians chapter 3, 28 and Colossians 3, 11. So, God chose Israel. God chose Israel to be a witness. Now, whenever God does such incredible things as that, we know that sin will often and almost always take occasion to monopolize on it some way or another. And it did. It did. It happened first with Israel. It happened first with the Israelites. Because they got their mind on this stupid idea that said, Aha! We know why God chose us. Because we are special. They stopped looking up. They started looking in. God makes that clear to them in multiple places. And remember, whenever God chose Israel, it's clear in the Old Testament, they weren't sinless. They were plagued, as we already said, with sin, just like all the other people. The Bible is clear on this. God says, and he warned them of this in the very, very beginning of choosing them. Deuteronomy 7. Look at this. Deuteronomy 7 Beginning in verse 6, he says, You are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his own possession out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love on you nor choose you because you were more in number than any of the peoples, for you were the fewest of all peoples. But because the Lord loved you and kept the oath for oath which he swore to your forefathers, the Lord brought you out of... Uh, by a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery, from the land of the Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Jump right over to chapter 9 of Deuteronomy. Verse 4. Do not say in your heart that the Lord your God has driven them out before you because of my righteousness. The Lord has brought me to possess this land, but it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord is dispossessing them from before you. You see what happened there? Israel goes in, they drive them out, and they're saying, hey, we know why we're getting this. It's because we're righteous. We're the chosen ones of God. He chose us because you know, we were great in number, and we were, we were special. It is not for your righteousness, or for the unrighteousness, or the uprightness, excuse me, of your heart, that you are going to possess their land, but it is because of the wickedness of these nations that the Lord your God is driving them out from before you in order to confirm the oath which the Lord swore to your fathers and to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
Know then that it is not because of your righteousness. He kind of repeats that, doesn't he? Because that's the propensity and the tendency then of sin. God makes it even more clear whenever you jump to the book of Ezekiel with me. And do that now. Ezekiel chapter 16. Ezekiel chapter 16. I would encourage you to read this entire chapter, especially those first 20 uh two verses. We're going to, for the sake of time, just jump down to verse, uh, let's go to 14. Then your fame, that is the fame of Israel, went forth among the nations. That's what God intended, didn't He? I chose you as my witness to all the nations, and your fame went Fourth among the nations on account of your beauty, for it was perfect. Wow. It was what God had designed in His choice of them. Because, He says, of my splendor which I bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. You didn't get and have the beauty in and of yourself, I gave it to you. And you can back up in the chapter and see that. He says, I found you whenever you were naked and squirming as a cast-off newborn baby in your blood in a field. Very detestable and unclean condition. But I gave you these things, and that made you beautiful because you are my witnesses notice verse 15 but you trusted in your beauty and played the harlot because of your fame and you poured out your harlotries on every possess passerby who might be willing so you see how sin distorted that the other nations sin was working in them because they were assaulting israel they were jealous. Instead of being repentant like Rahab, they became jealous of that. That was their response. As a matter of fact, it was so evident and so clear historically in the Old Testament that God had chosen Israel to be His witnesses that whenever you come to the New Testament, God does special things to make it very clear that salvation has come to the world. As a matter of fact, in Acts 13, the Gentiles who hear that message rejoice because historically they knew that the God of all creation, the God of heaven and the God of earth, that God, the one true God, He's chosen Israel. Acts chapter 13 Verse 44, Then the next Sabbath early the whole city assembled to hear the word of the Lord. But when the Jews saw, that the crowd, saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began contradicting the things spoken by Paul and were blaspheming. Paul and Barnabas spoke out boldly and said, It was necessary that the word of the Lord be spoken to you first since you repudiate it and judge yourselves unworthy of eternal life, behold, we are turning to the Gentiles. For so the Lord has commanded us, I have placed you as a light for the Gentiles that you may bring salvation. And notice this, to the, whole, to the end of the earth. And notice the response of the Gentiles in verse 48. When the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord and as many as had been appointed to eternal life believed. They rejoiced in the fact that salvation isn't just limited to being a part of the nation of Israel now. It's extending to the entire world, to Gentiles. Well, it's not saying that Gentiles couldn't be saved in the Old Testament. We read of Rahab. She was saved. We mentioned Melchizedek. He wasn't an Israelite. He was a priest of the Most High God. He was saved. And there are others in the Old Testament that were not Israelites, 
that were saved. But God raised these people in this nation up as his witness that we cannot deny. And sin warped that. The Israelites thought, oh, he chose us because we were special. The Jew or the Gentiles were jealous of that and wanted their own gods. And they thought, well, if we shoot the witness, the messenger, that takes care of the truth. And that's what they did. That was their sinful response. As a matter of fact, God even warns in the book of Romans, chapter 11, verses 17 through 21, those who are in the church, that you've been grafted in. And if you get heady and high-minded, just keep in mind, I can take you out. And that's a big paraphrase. Go and read Romans 11, 17 through 21. So now we come to these verses, and we come to the end of our time this morning. But you have that history in your mind there now. And so, as we move into these, and by the way, if you look over to Acts 10, we didn't even cover that. Acts 10 is God showing Peter that nothing he has made is unclean. And Peter had to make the application of that to people. You see, the Jews were thinking, well, you know, I know why God chose us. We're, we're better than all the rest. We're better. We're special. You know, we're special. God didn't set his love on anybody because they were special. God didn't set his love on anybody because of anybody. He sets his love on those he sets his love on because of himself. And that's the end of it. It's not according to the man who wills or the man who runs, God says, but according to God who has mercy. Who has mercy. So we come now to these verses. Peter has been sent to the Gentiles. He was the first witness to them, as I mentioned there in Acts 10. Paul and Barnabas would be sent to them in general. Peter took the gospel first to them and demonstrated, hey, salvation has came has come to the Gentiles. And that was really, if you look at Genesis, or Acts 10 and 11, that was not just to communicate that message to the Gentiles as much as it was to communicate that message to the Jews whenever you move into chapter 11. And that they are saved, Gentiles are saved, just as the Jews are saved, by faith, by belief in Christ. So go back in closing with me to Colossians chapter 3, verse 11. Colossians 3, 11. A renewal in which there's no distinction between Greek and Jew. It's not about being a Greek. It's not about being a Jew in this renewal. Circumcise those who have undergone circumcision or those who are not circumcised. Barbarian. A barbarian was a person that did not speak Greek. They had another natural language besides the Greek language that they spoke. As a matter of fact, this word is considered to be an automatopoeia. It sounds like what the people would hear, babbling. Babbling. And then he says, "There's not Babylon, or there's not uh, barbarians, or Scythians. The Scythians, they also did not speak, speak Greek, and they were even considered worse than the barbarian people. Not that the barbarian people were barbarous. That is something that developed later on, but they just didn't speak the Greek language. They were barbarian in that sense." The Scythians, on the other hand, were a violent people. And they were a nomadic tribe. They lived north of the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea, and that was their region. He goes on and he says, notice this, slave or free man? Slave and free man. It's not about any of those things. 
Now, we're going to stop there for just a moment. And you remember we brought in Galatians 3.28. And in Galatians 3.28, Paul is saying a similar thing that there is in reference to being in Christ, there's no Jew or Gentile, there's no man or woman, there's no bondman, slave or free man. Just as sin took hold of the fact that God had chosen Israel in multiple ways, sin twisted that and distorted that, as we mentioned already. It does the same thing with this. There are people running around today that believe this verse, Colossians 3.11 and Galatians 3.28, cancel God's dealing with Israel. It's over. Well, I got a little problem with that. Well, actually, I got a big problem with that. That movement's called supersessionism. There's all kinds of levels of it. So does God cancel out men and women? Because he said man and woman, right? I don't think so. Paul, in this very context, as in the context with Ephesians over there, has very specific instructions for men and women. He doesn't negate roles. That's not what this is about. As a matter of fact, just as a little side note, those who believe these verses actually cancel out God's dealing with Israel, interestingly enough, they are in the same camp that want to say that you, if you're a Christian, you're a spiritual Jew. Or you're the Israelite. I'm thinking, make up your mind. Either he's canceled them or he's not. And if he's canceled them, don't make me one. I don't want a part of it. If, it's, if God's canceled it, yes, believe it or not, it's just that simple. He's not negating them. He's demonstrating a greater truth here. And that is, look at the last phrase of Colossians 3.11. But Christ is all and in all. It's about Christ. And we'll come back to this last phrase next week because there is much here in this phrase of this verse. We needed to bring this history in though because that shows us the significance, biblically speaking, not just looking at cultural situations in the day, but a history behind these verses and the significance of why the Apostle Paul here is saying that there are no, that in Christ there's no distinction between Jew and Gentile. What a praise that is. It's about Christ. It's about knowing Him. About being born of God. In this context, about being transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved Son. I want to ask you to stand with me this morning. You know, we spend a lot of time looking at all of those verses. And again, as I mentioned, there are many, many other verses. And we did so so that whenever you come to these two verses, Colossians 3.11, Galatians 3.28, you'll have that history there. You'll see the significance of that. You'll understand the weight of what Paul is saying of what God has done in Jesus Christ. We're, we live in a culture today that, that it, it wants everything fast, quick. I mean, everything. Everything. Even our meals. You want to go into a restaurant? I remember traveling whenever I was a kid, and you'd go and you stop at a cafe somewhere on the outskirts of the highway someplace, and you go in, you're going to spend some time in there if you order anything to eat. You know why? Because they didn't zap it in the microwave. They had to cook it on the stove, cook it in the grill. It wasn't pre-done in a little TV tray, and they zap it or heat it up even. They had to mix all the stuff together, and they had to put it on the grill, and they had to cook it, and you had to wait. And people sat down, and they just enjoyed the meal because of the weight was part of it. And now, what do we do? We think, I, I want it now, I want it now. And we 
cheat ourselves sometimes out of very, very good meals because of this idea of just having it now. Now. Well, you know, whenever you bring in the history of these verses and the weight of them, you see the significance and the power that is there and the liberation. And you can understand more significantly those Gentiles in Acts 13 who rejoice because they realize salvation has come to the Gentiles. It's not just reserved for the Jews. Father in heaven, thank you that salvation has come to the world in Jesus Christ. And whosoever shall call on his name will be saved. I pray, Lord, that you bring the significance of these truths to our minds. In Jesus' name.